is Dr. Adams, and in this aspect of occlusion eight, we are going to be discussing the technique and the steps for doing an occlusal adjustment. Uh, this follows closely on the heels of the previous uh, part of occlusion eight, dealing with the anatomy of the dentition and the rules. We're going to be somewhat overlapping a little bit on the rules for selective grinding, but it's important that we address ourselves specifically to the technique for occlusal adjustment and the difference between spot grinding, partial, and complete occlusal adjustment. We'll be spending practically all of our time dealing with a complete occlusal adjustment. Um, again, to sort of reiterate what we discussed before, spot grinding is a time-honored technique which any restorative dentist has um, relied on on a daily basis to make sure that any one new individual restoration, inlay, onlay, crown, etc., is not too high. Uh, grind, basically, it's a technique of grinding a little bit here, grinding a little bit there until it is no longer high. As long as the spot grinding technique of adjusting the occlusion is limited to one or two teeth at a time, it's a successful way of eliminating high spots. However, the spot grinding technique is pretty much just that. That is, it's uh, directed toward grinding high spots. And so if you att attempt to use this technique in a complete occlusal adjustment or a partial occlusal adjustment, you're almost bound to have failure because a spot grinding technique pays little or no attention to the various criteria for a good occlusion, which we've discussed, namely stability and centric and multi-tooth guiding movements right and left. Well, if we go to the slides now, we'll start to, first of all, discuss the various types of occlusion. Now, again, by this time in the course, you should realize that the overridingly important factor is the functional occlusion. That is, how the teeth come together in various maxillomandibular relations and how the joints and the muscles of mastication and the periodontium function as these jaws or mandibles are moved through their various movements. Now, number two, an ideal occlusion, as per your um, handout and glossary of occlusal terminology, an ideal occlusion refers to the type of functional occlusion which is so good that little, if any, neuromuscular adaptation is necessary for these teeth to come together in an appropriate manner. As opposed to this, a morphologic occlusion, while it is quite important, may or may not have any relation whatsoever to a functional occlusion. In morphologic occlusion in the natural dentition, we're specifically uh, thinking here in terms of an orthodontic morphologic alignment of the teeth so that each arch, uh, in each arch, the teeth are nice and straight. We talk about the amount of overbite and overjet, the cusp fossa relations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, it is quite possible to have good morphology, nicely aligned and straight teeth, ideal arch form, and yet one arch to the other arch is very poor, and you have a net result, a poor functional occlusion. Now, the next thing, the normal occlusion would be one in which the patient may have some prematurities or interferences, but is well within normal limits. There is some physiologic adaptation but as yet there is no breakdown or uh, no dysfunction in the masticatory system. A physiologic occlusion would be rather similar to a normal occlusion, that is, it is one which has no dysfunction. At the same time, looking at number six, a pathogenic occlusion could be a physiologic occlusion in the sense that it is an occlusion which is, has the capabilities of producing pathology or dysfunction, but until the present time, the masticatory system has not gone into dysfunction, and therefore it could be considered a pathogenic but not a pathologic occlusion. And we have discussed under separate uh, modules uh, traumatic occlusion to the periodontium, uh, primary and secondary uh, occlusal traumatism. Now, <clears throat> whenever one discusses occlusion in restorative dentistry or occlusion and occlusal adjustment, you must always keep in mind, and look at this old slide of Henry here, we don't want to close the vertical dimension so that the chin can get closer to the nose. This is extremely important to remember in this particular aspect of occlusion when we're talking about how and when and where to grind upon the teeth. 
If you are not careful, you can end up closing the vertical dimension, which is certainly not a desirable aspect. At the same time, uh, it is theoretically possible under an occlusal adjustment technique to open the vertical dimension. You would do this simply by adjusting everything to RC or the centric relation position, making maximum intercuspation coincide with this and it is therefore theoretically possible, although in practical terms difficult to do, but still you could open the bite by an occlusal adjustment technique. Again, the ideal thing is to end up with old Herman here having the same vertical dimension after he's, you're finished with him as before you start. Now the occlusal adjustment techniques are many and varied. We've already discussed the spot grinding. We've discussed under separate uh, titles the aspect and the concept of grinding where the people function, that is at their particular IC. And again, this is wrought with dangers, particularly if the functional centric or the intercuspal position has the mandible off the mid-sagittal plane to one side. Nathologic tripodization is a grinding technique which could be done, but again, to reiterate, uh, the price that you pay clinically is, I believe, far too high that you must almost mutilate the dentition in order to get a tripod type of arrangement. We've discussed under separate title again the technique of cusp reduction, and I would implore you never to grind on cusps, and we'll discuss this more in a moment in relationship to the type of occlusal adjustment which we are teaching you, and that is the elimination of prematurities and occlusal interferences. Again, there is the buccal lingual reduction technique, which we discussed before, and the main point is we emphasize that this is very limited in its application clinically, and as an aspect of the elimination of prematurities and interferences, we do to some extent reduce buccal lingual diameter. Now you could end up with a cuspid rise or with a group function type of working side occlusion according to the same rules, that is the bull rule. You either grind on the posterior teeth according to the bull rule to eliminate all contact but the cuspid, and in this way you end up with a cuspid rise. Conversely to this, if you have a cuspid rise and for some reason uh, deem it necessary or desirable to end up with group function, you would again use the bull rule, this time grinding on the cuspids, and you would then end up with group function. Balanced occlusion, once again, is that which we use for the artificial dentures and which is totally non-applicable for the natural dentition. Now, and the next thing we need to address ourselves to is the concept of a prophylactic grinding or prophylactic occlusal adjustment. I would very strongly emphasize here that we do not emphasize prophylactically doing a complete occlusal adjustment on any patient. The patient must have something wrong with them as per the handouts which you've gotten. Uh, the one handout in particular shows on the left column of the page uh, we call subjective symptoms. The patient has to have either bruxing, periodontal disease, signs and symptoms of traumatic occlusion, be a post-orthodontic patient or something like this. And then if the patient has one or more of those subjective symptoms I just mentioned, you then would do a complete functional occlusal analysis and if the patient has RCIC prematurities and balancing interferences and bad working side prematurities, then you would consider doing an occlusal adjustment. But again, that is a far cry from doing a prophylactic grinding where you merely grind everybody's dentition according to the concepts which we've taught you here. Indications for occlusal adjustment, again, when you have signs and symptoms of traumatic occlusion, bruxism, TM joint arthralgias, myalgias, etc., prior to occlusal reconstruction. And again, these things are, uh, I think, a little bit more neatly lined out for you in the printed handouts which we've provided. The principles of occlusal adjustment, this is according to the author of your textbook, uh, Ramford, uh, are as follows. You wish to eliminate premature contacts, occlusal interferences, get optimum functional relations, and obtain occlusal stability. And again, down here, centric stops should be arranged in such a way that main occlusal force will be applied to the tooth in an axial direction, which has been well described previously. Again, to sum it up rather neatly, an old slide for you now, but very briefly recap one textbook after another, stability and centric, smooth unimpeded multidirectional movements and comfort. 
Again, the, the principles are the same. The principles are the same whether you're grinding the occlusion, as we're discussing today, or whether you're worried about occlusion and restorative dentistry. What is an occlusal adjustment? Again, right according to the glossary of terminology you've been given, it's a judicious reshaping of occlusal areas as a therapeutic procedure to eliminate the prematurities and interferences to obtain stability and optimum masticatory effectiveness. And again, the premature contacts are occlusal contacts or interferences before stable jaw-to-jaw -jaw relationship in either RC or IC or in the area between these two positions. And occlusal interferences are contacts which hamper or hinder the smooth, gliding, harmonious jaw movements with teeth in contact. Again, in any lateral excursion, protrusive, or anywhere in between there. And again, the whole concept in, a fun in an occlusal adjustment is to end up with functional occlusion. The very same concepts that you should employ if you are doing or thinking of another aspect of this, and that is occlusion and restorative dentistry. If you put in night guards or occlusal splints or anything like this, again, the principles of obtaining a functional occlusion are the same. Briefly, to reiterate from a previous aspect of this module, primary rules in doing occlusal adjustment are, number one, do not grind or reduce a cusp tip, and number two, do not deepen or grind away in a central groove or central fossa area. Again, the one number one thing you wish to keep in mind with this at all times is the aspect of stability. This is taken directly from your textbook and goes in conjunction with a previous phase of this module, and that is that as we go posteriorly, there tends to be an axial inclination of the teeth, the mandibular teeth leaning more and more to the lingual, uh, the maxillary teeth leaning more and more toward the buckle. Now, specifically in an occlusal adjustment technique, if you have a third molar arrangement like so, and if you can obtain centric uh, contacts only here or here, but not both. Due to the axial inclination, it is far wiser to have your centric stops here, that is on the mandibular buckle cusp in the maxillary central groove region, rather than here. The simple reason for this being that contacts here when vectored out would fall outside of the axial inclination of the teeth and would tend to drive the mandibular tooth more lingually. On the other hand, if you had the contacts here only, these fall pretty much within the roots of the tooth and would lead more towards stability rather than instability. Again, if you look at uh, plaster models which are articulated and then sectioned through molar teeth, you get the idea of the buccal plane of the buccal cusps versus the actual axial inclination of these teeth. And this is what you need to keep in mind at all times, either in doing an occlusal adjustment or in attempting to get good occlusion in everyday restorative dentistry. Now, if we go back to this diagram of the border movements of the mandible in the mid-sagittal plane, the next question which should come up is what happens when we do an occlusal adjustment? Number one, we do not wish to close the vertical dimension. That is, we don't wish to get the chin closer to the nose. But at the same time, in the technique which we are teaching you, you do close the vertical at centric. And the answer to the confusion here is that you should address yourself to which centric. Again, if you remember, this is the hinge axis of opening and closing, IC and RC here, and up here, this horizontal line is the plane of occlusion. What we attempt to do in the technique for occlusal adjustment, which will be discussed with you now, is to put centric relation and centric occlusion on the same plane. We start the occlusal adjustment by getting the mandible to the hinge axis arc of opening and closing. We then mark the prematurities at RC, and then we grind the teeth or reshape the teeth in such a manner that we end up doing this, establishing a new RC or RC2, which will be on the same plane as the original IC. Now, when we do this, what we do is we eliminate all of the inclined plane interferences between RC and IC. In the process of doing so, almost always you will see that the patient on his own, through neuromuscular proprioception, 
will reposition the mandible somewhat more posteriorly toward the new RC or RC2. So that again, to reiterate, what we do is we eliminate occlusal prematurities at RC and primarily in between RC and IC so that you end up on the same plane, the same occlusal plane as you had originally at IC. In so doing, you close the vertical dimension at centric relation. You close it to the vertical dimension previously existing at the original IC or centric occlusion. Again, by eliminating all of these prematurities in this area here, most of the time you will find that the patient will reposition his mandible somewhat more distally than he was able to do originally. Now, if you'll think back to the Telemann diagonal law, which we discussed previously, and the ways to eliminate or to lighten occlusal forces on anterior teeth, we made a strong point of the fact that you should first check RC, and if there are RC prematurities, to eliminate those. This now illustrates the reason why that is important, because when you get rid of RC prematurities, you eliminate the diagonal law of Telemann phenomena, and at the same time, almost always, the patient will reposition the mandible somewhat more posteriorly. As he does this, a lot of the stress and the load on the anterior teeth is removed. And then you go ahead and grind on the anterior teeth only if you continue to have stresses on those once you have done this. Now, one reason why you can get RC prematurities and why it's difficult to correct them is the fact that the mandibular arch shown here in dotted lines is a tapering arch which fits inside the maxillary arch, which also is tapering, but maybe not to the same degree as the mandibular arch. And again, remember in function that the mandibular arch, the teeth with the dotted lines, are moving anteroposteriorly at all times during function uh, at the at terminal aspects of chewing and during the act of swallowing. And so for this reason, you need to watch the anatomy of the upper and the lower teeth and how they intercuspate one with another during the anteroposterior movements. Now then, as with any other rule or law, you cannot make any uh, law uh, all-inclusive. We mentioned uh, just previously the fact you never grind on a cusp tip and you never deepen the central fossa, but such is not the truth. It is, in clinical practice, the truth about 99% of the time. But this illustrates the other 1% of the time when you may have to deepen the fossa or when you may have to reduce a cusp tip. Now, to illustrate this with these rather simplified line drawings of teeth, there are three key positions which you must consider, C or centric, and this would include RC and IC, working side and balancing side. Now, if a cusp tip is premature in one or two of these three key positions, you would then reduce the central fossa or deepen the central fossa instead. As illustrated here, this cusp tip would be high at centric relation, for instance, not contact in the working excursion or the balancing excursion. In this instance, then, you would deepen the fossa. And you see down here that the cusp tip is high at centric and high at working side. In this instance, again, the cusp tip is high in two out of the three key positions. Again, you deepen the fossa to eliminate the centric prematurity. When you get to the working side, you would take care of this according to the bull rule, which we'll discuss more in a moment. You see the same illustration, only in this case it would be a maxillary lingual cusp, and the same thing deepening the mandibular fossa. Again, you deepen the fossa once in a rare, rare long time, and you would deepen the fossa if there's definitely a cusp tip that is premature hitting that fossa, and if that cusp tip is premature in only one or two of the three key positions. Now then, you break the law of never grinding or reducing a cusp tip under this one rare circumstance, and that is if the cusp tip is premature in all three of the key positions. In this illustration, the mandibular buccal cusp tip is premature at centric and working and balancing side. In this particular instance, then you would reduce the cusp tip.
of the mandibular buccal cusp. The same thing here, illustrating in this case the maxillary lingual cusp. So again, to reiterate in practical clinical terms, for most purposes you can say you never reduce a cusp tip or deep in the central fossa, but then remember that there are exceptions to every rule. These are the exceptions. Again, clinically, they are very rare. Before you deepen a fossa or reduce a cusp tip, think twice, think long and hard. It almost never needs to be done, but these are the instances where it does need to be done. Again, to reiterate from the previous aspect of occlusion 8, the rules for occlusal adjustment, the muddle rule, which we're going to discuss now for RC and IC. Now, in the logical orderly progression of a complete occlusal adjustment, which involves uh, correcting RC and IC and the shift between the two, taking care of working balance and protrusive, in the logical orderly sequential steps, you first take care of RC and IC and you use primarily the muddle rule to do that. After the RC and IC occlusion is taken care of, you then would go to one lateral excursion and take care of the balancing side prematurities first, according to the Lovell rule, and then you would address yourself to the opposite side of the mouth and correct working side contacts, again, according to the Bull rule, if you feel that working side contact adjustment or correction is indicated. After doing this in one lateral excursion, you would then do the other lateral excursion the very same way. After the lateral excursions are taken care of, the last thing you do then is take care of protrusive, and you would do that according to the Dummel rule. Now, to get back to the muddle rule, M-U-D-L stands for mesially directed inclines on upper teeth and distally directed inclines on lower teeth. This diagram might be rather difficult to visualize, but in essence, it is a mesial distal section of upper premolars and a lower premolar somewhere through the middle of the tooth. At centric occlusion, or IC, the lower buccal cusp would land somewhere in the region of the marginal ridges. When the mandible is retruded, the hinge axis arc of closure and closed, you would see that the mandibular premolar buccal cusp tip would be hitting prematurely on a maxillary premolar incline, and it would have to be an incline which is facing in a mesial direction. Again, following the simple rules, never grind on a cusp tip, never grind on the uh, central fossa. You would have no alternative but to reshape the maxillary mesially directed incline like so, so that when the man patient's mandible was closed on the hinge axis, that you now had solid cusp tip central fossa contact in this area. Again, keep in mind that these are two-dimensional line drawings to illustrate principle. In the real world, in real live three-dimensional teeth, you would not gro great, uh, greatly reduce any tooth structure. It's a very small amount. However, granted for illustrations, it looks like a tremendous amount. The same principle would apply if a maxillary lingual cusp as a supporting cusp would hit prematurely in a mandibular incline plane. Again, it would have to be a distally facing mandibular incline plane. And again, you don't grind cusp tips, so you would reshape the distally directed mandibular incline so that at RC, you would have a good solid cusp tip fossa relationship. And here you have gotten for yourself on one tooth a small freedom centric or long centric contact, RC here and IC here. Now again, keep in mind that it's all not that simple, that you must at all times pay attention to the mandible and its relationship to the mid-sagittal plane. Probably the most disturbing thing to the masticatory system is a centric occlusion or intercuspal position, uh, which is off the mid-sagittal plane. As we have seen and discussed previously in one patient, for example. And again, you must think in terms of what would cause the mandible to be displaced to one side. Again, in this illustration, assuming that at IC the mandible is off the mid-sagittal plane to the patient's right side, it is this combination of incline planes or cusp tip on incline planes which would cause a bodily shift of the mandible to that side. 
So it's not a simple matter of the muddle rule, but it's the muddle rule along with the buccal or lingually inclined planes, again, in a muddle direction, which would cause the mandible to move this way. And in doing an occlusal adjustment, you would have to reshape these teeth so that you would have a stable intercuspal position with the mandible remaining in the mid-sagittal plane. Again, the principles are the same in restorative dentistry. Sometimes it is impossible to eliminate a lateral slide of the mandible into IC simply by grinding and reshaping teeth. If this is impossible, then it is necessary to reposition that mandible so that the IC position is in the mid-sagittal plane by building into your restorations inclined planes to more or less prevent the mandible from sliding to the side. All right, now once we have finished our RC and IC uh, occlusal adjustment, again, attempting to avoid grinding on cusp tips and deepening fossas and doing it according to the muddle rule, the next thing we do is address ourselves to lateral excursions. This particular illustration here shows the mandible moving to the left side. Again, this shows cross-tooth balance where both the buccal and the lingual cusps contact smoothly and simultaneously. If you remember, we've discussed previously, it's very difficult to say that this type of an occlusion is any better than or that it's any worse than having strictly buccal cusps contacting. You may or may not wish to have this type of an alignment. However, we do know, again, that we don't want balancing interferences. So, if you address yourself, first of all, in the patient or in the models on an articulator, to lateral excursions, when you go into a left lateral excursion, the very first thing that you do is to eliminate the balancing type of contacts. And you would do this according to the Lubbell rule, which is the lingual of the upper and the buccal of the lower. But again, as we stressed under the laws for occlusal adjustment, you must be very careful that you don't eliminate your centric stops. Now, once you have adjusted or eliminated the balancing interferences, you would then go look at the working side bite and adjust that. But before we go to that, again, getting back to the level rule, if a cusp or incline which interferes in balance is out of occlusion in centric, and that can be either RC or IC, you grind on that cusp or incline. As you would see here, this is your centric type of contact, balancing contacts like so. It may be hard to see, but in this illustration, the maxillary lingual cusp is not contacting in the mandibular central groove area. And so if it is premature and if it's causing a heavy balancing contact, you can reshape and reduce it as shown by the hatch marks here. Conversely to that, if your centric stops are primarily on your upper lingual cusps in the mandibular fossa, and if the lower buccal cusp does not contact here, and if it does contact and create a heavy balancing interference, obviously you would wish to keep your centric stop here and grind away the potential centric stop, which in this instance and in illustration is not acting or functioning as a centric stop. This is why it is a good idea to use two colors of articulating paper, as we'll illustrate and show you in a moment. If you use one color, blue for instance, for your centric stops, and red for your lateral excursions, it is rather simple matter to pick up which ones of these are centric stops and which ones are not contacted at all. Again, the illustration in centric, you'd have contacts here and here. As you come out on the balancing side, you may have interference and grind like that or like that. By the way, this is slide is upside down in case you're confused. All right, once you have corrected and taken care of the balancing side contact, you would then wish to observe whether or not uh, you have working side prematurities. Again, you use the bull rule to do this. Now, assuming that you feel that there is something wrong on the working side and that you need to grind or to reshape according to the bull rule, once you are happy with the working side contact, you must go back and pay attention to the balancing side contacts. See if you have any. 
The simple reason why is that according to the grinding with a bull rule, you would shave a little bit here, you would shave a little bit here. And in this particular maxillomandibular relationship, as you grind to improve working side contact, you actually close the vertical dimension with the mandible pushed out to this side. As you do this, it is quite conceivable that you could once again close the vertical enough that you could create balancing side interferences which did not exist prior to grinding over here. Therefore, in the clinic, in a stepwise procedure, once you go to a lateral excursion, you first check for balance contacts, eliminate them if they are present, evaluate working side contacts. If you feel it is necessary to work on them, you do so, and then immediately you go back and check for balance contacts. If balance contacts have been recreated, you would then eliminate them once again, and then once again evaluate working side contacts. If you still feel that you need to do any adjustment here, do it. When you're finished, go back once again and evaluate for the presence or absence of balancing side contacts. I feel at this point that you should stop adjusting in that particular lateral excursion. Again, to reiterate, in any lateral excursion, first eliminate balance, correct working side one time if you feel it's indicated. If you've corrected working side, go back again and check balance and eliminate it. If you feel you have more work to do on the working side, I feel you should pay attention to the working side only on two occasions. After the second session of working on working side uh, contacts, again go back here to eliminate this and then call it quits. Otherwise, you can get into a vicious seesaw back and forth of trying to improve working side, eliminating balance, and back and forth and back and forth. I feel that if you cannot do the adjustment and get your desired results with two sessions of working on the working side, that to obtain best working side occlusion, perhaps you need to think in terms of some restorative dentistry, doing it by grinding or by the stone alone technique probably is inadequate and you will end up um, mutilating the dentition far more uh, than would uh, be indicated as far as the results are concerned. When you get to the working side again, if you have contact out here, according to the bull rule, you would grind on this aspect of the upper or on this aspect of the lower or on both. Once you have taken care of RCIC, the RCIC shift, and once you've gotten left and right lateral excursions taken care of, you then pay attention to protrusive from IC out to the edge to edge. Again, you would primarily grind on the lingual aspect of the maxillary anterior teeth, hopefully not too much. When you do grind, you try to stay away from the labial aspect of the incisal edge. If you get too far to the labial, what you will do is uh, an aesthetic injustice to the patient. You would be shortening one tooth at the expense of other teeth, and this is not a very good idea. So you attempt at all costs to limit the grinding and protrusive to the lingual aspect of the upper teeth. However, in some instances, if you have, say, extrusion of a couple of anterior teeth, as we have shown you some illustrations of, in that case, perhaps you would wish to shorten the upper tooth and the lower tooth. Again, this is very rarely done. Very rarely is it indicated or necessary to do this type of correction. Again, this is an old diagram to you now as to how to eliminate trauma. Again, I put it in here to emphasize the fact that first you want to get rid of RCIC prematurities, uh, taking into consideration the Telemann diagonal law phenomena. Quite often you will stop this simply by getting a new RC and a new IC and the mandible positioning itself slightly more distally, which will dramatically relieve the contacts in this area and the pressures. Again, if it doesn't eliminate them, then you go through this stepwise procedure. Again, in doing anterior jackets, if you have this kind of an arrangement, you may wish to take care of it that way. Now, what are the exact um, materials, et cetera, that we recommend? Well, there's many on the market, and um, there are many, many different ways of doing it. This is the type of material that I recommend using. I recommend using two colors of articulating paper, which comes in boxes, 
This is the Minol thin articulating paper. Make sure that you do not get a new material which this company has put out, which is called Blue Line. It is a thinner material. The paper is an entirely different consistency. The color uh, impregnation on the paper is not good. The net result to you is frustration clinically because you cannot mark the prematurities and interferences well. As I mentioned previously, I personally like to use the blue paper to mark RC and IC prematurities. And after we've taken care of the RC and IC prematurities, you then wipe the teeth clean with gauze. You then put in red thin minol articulating paper and have the patient move into left and right lateral excursions, lateral to IC, which the patient can do himself. And then you reposition the mandible to the hinge axis, arc of closure, close to RC. And then with some firm distal and lateral guidance from your guiding hand, you then have the patient go into left and right lateral posterior border movements and mark your working and balancing contacts in red. You also use red to mark the protrusive contacts. Once this is done, you then put in two new pieces of blue articulating paper and mark your RC and IC contacts. And in this way, on the occlusal surface, you can see rather readily where your balancing contacts are, your working side prematurities, protrusive prematurities, and at the same time maintaining your centric stops, which you worked so hard to get. This curve occlusal indicator wax is 28 or 30 gauge uh, wax with one shiny side and one dull side. The shiny side is a sticky side, has a slight adhesive to it, and you would use this shiny side to stick the wax to the teeth. <clears throat> the occlusal wax over the teeth helps to show you the occlusal prematurities at RC and at IC. And in the TV tapes that we have on occlusal adjustment technique, we go to great length to show you stepwise how to incorporate the occlusal wax and the blue and the red paper into the entire process. Something you may not see too readily, but this is a dental floss loop. It's the one purpose I can find for wax dental floss. You take about 12 inches of wax dental floss, tie it in a knot, and you have a loop of um, dental floss, which helps you to find um, balancing interferences, working side interferences, by simply placing it between the teeth, having the patient move his mandible to one side with the teeth together. You pull the dental floss to see if you have a catch or if you don't. And again, this is shown, I think, rather well in the TV taping. As far as the materials that I recommend using, uh, this would be strictly under um, inst instruction and help from um, a Bay instructor. It would be high-speed instrumentation. On the other hand, I feel that initially in learning to do this technique, slow-speed instrumentation would be better. Uh, a closer-up view of this, you could use uh, diamond stones, as shown here, white stones or green stones. These are uh, blue wheels and blue points, which we use to smooth down the occlusal surfaces after they've been ground upon. One nice thing about the green stone or the white stone is that they are not nearly as coarse as even the fine diamonds. So therefore, using a green or white stone, the surface of the enamel is much smoother. And this reduces the amount of time you need to spend with blue wheels or minol wheels or whatever you wish to use. In any case, and particularly with bruxures, we do not want to end up with a rough uh, surface to the enamel. This would, in a bruxure, help to create and trigger further bruxing in an attempt to smooth off those little roughnesses and irregularities. Now, one clinical hint to make your life easier. As you know, you wish to use two pieces of articulating paper, one to cover each side of the arch at a time. If you crease the paper like so, it makes the management of the paper much easier. As you see here, this is a piece of articulating paper which has been creased. This is a similar piece of paper taken from the same packet, and you see how limp and unwieldy and difficult it is to handle. <coughs> Again, a close-up view here of a white stone. The white stone is not too white at the present time. It's incorporated um, into it a bunch of amalgam and gold, uh, which had to be ground away. Uh, an indirect way of saying that 
quite often in doing an occlusal adjustment, the main things you're grinding on are improperly contoured dental restorations. Again, the blue points and the blue wheels to smooth the surfaces. One of the purposes of using the green occlusal wax is to find the which areas of the occlusion are extremely high. They will be shown by actual perforations or holes in the wax. The other areas which are not quite so high but relatively high will show up in the wax as thin spots as you see here. Uh, the thinner the spot, the relatively higher uh, the prematurity. This helps you very much in locating and figuring out in the step-by-step -step procedure which spots should be ground on the teeth. This is uh, a picture of some Madame Butterfly typewriter ribbon, silk ribbon impregnated with red dye. Some people advocate using this. In my hands, personally, I find it rather difficult to use. However, that does not mean that it's bad. It's just another way of doing it. Now then, we'll go to a few slides to illustrate, uh, hopefully in a step-by-step -step manner, um, the technique for doing an occlusal adjustment. In the slide portion here, we're going to limit this strictly to taking care of RC and IC prematurities, and we will limit this to only one side. This is a mirror view showing the patient's left side. At RC, there are prematurities here and here on the lower teeth. On the upper teeth, those prematurities were here and here. If you would then go in and grind a little bit up here and in here, again, taking care not to deepen the fossa, you, and then go back and remark, you would end up the second time around with contacts here, which are much better. They're more toward the cusp tip rather than being way down on the incline areas. We're approaching the cusp tip here. We still have some incline here. We're beginning to pick up some prematurities in here and here. On the upper, you see we now have contacts in here and here. We still have some on incline planes, which are not good, but we're getting there. So then we would grind some more on those teeth go back and remark them, and this is a straight on shot now. You see now we have a cusp tip contact, a little bit of prematurity on an incline, cusp tip plus incline, cu cusp tip plus incline, but now we're getting contacts in the central groove region here and here and here and here and here. In the maxillary arch, you see the same sort of thing. We have contacts here and here and here. We're now getting more contacts in the line of the central groove we still have prematurities on inclines here and here and here and here, but it is getting better. So if you did some more adjustment and then remark them, you would see that we now just about have what we want at RC and IC, and that would be contacts on the cusp tips in these areas here, contacts in the line of the central groove coming down like so. In the maxillary arch, you would see the same kind of thing along the lingual cusp tips and in the line of the central fossa. Again, we have a few prematurities on inclines, but we've pretty well eliminated those. So now if we go to the opposite side, you would see that this slide is out of focus somewhat, but our initial RC prematurity is in this region here. Mark it on the lower, you see that it's not on the cusp tip, but rather it's on an incline as you see here. If you then did some grinding and went back and remarked them, you would see that that contact is now pretty much where we want it on the cusp tip, shown in the mirror shot here. Now our prematurity on this right side is on this nice shiny um, inlay. The inlay itself is fine, but the occlusion on the inlay leaves something to be desired. In the maxilla, the prematurity would be on this area here. So now we're faced with a uh, problem, should we grind here or should we grind on the opposing mandibular tooth which has the gold inlay and actually it's a gold margin? Well, I would recommend you grind here rather than take the chance of grinding through the gold on the mandibular tooth and perhaps getting marginal leakage. So we would grind here and then go back and remark again and you see this time that we now have contacts much better on the buccal cusp tips. You see we now have contact on the buccal cusp tips here, and we're getting them here. And we're now getting a few contacts in the region of the central grooves of the mandibular teeth. <clears throat> in 
the maxillary teeth, you see we still have prematurities on inclines there, but we're now getting centric relation, centric occlusion contacts much better on cusp tips and in central fossa regions. If we then grind, go back and remark again, you see we've just about gotten what we would like, and that is centric relation, centric occlusion contacts, cusp tips, virtually no incline planes, and in the central groove region here, and in the maxilla, we have contacts on the lingual cusp tips, and in the central groove areas, little or no inclined plane contacts. To go back and show you an old, old slide, which we have addressed ourselves to many times down through the years, the old cusp coloring exercise to show you how cusp tips should line up in the central groove region. You've seen this enough to understand the principles. Now from here we go right back to the same patient which we've just done the occlusal adjustment on. And you will see that in essence in this patient we have gotten the desired results which we've shown you how to do in the cusp coloring. This is both sides put together now. RC and IC contacts on cusp tips and in the line of the central fossa right and left sides. If you now look at the maxillary arch you see that we've gotten the same kind of thing. With a small exception here, this needs to be improved a little bit. The same thing over here. This could be improved a little bit. But the main point is that the early didactic material which you were taught according to cusp coloring exercises is a very definite and important prerequisite to ending up with the same type of thing in a patient's mouth. Now to reiterate again, Spot grinding is done according to the grind all blue spots technique of the bull rule. This has very, very limited application for a complete or for a partial occlusal adjustment. Again, in a complete occlusal adjustment, you're taking care of RC and IC and lateral excursions and protrusive prematurities, whereas in a partial occlusal adjustment, you leave RC and IC alone and you merely eliminate heavy balance working or premature contacts. One other rule that again I cannot re reiterate strongly enough is that in doing an occlusal adjustment you very definitely need to plan ahead and never get stuck as this poor fellow was way out on the end. Again the rules for occlusal adjustment almost never do you grind on a cusp tip and almost never do you deepen a central groove. So you are left adjusting what? naturally you're left adjusting the inclined planes. Model for RC and IC, Dummel for protrusive, Bull for working side, and Lubbel for balancing side contacts. Now then, to reiterate and to pretty much summarize um, all of the submodules and modules on occlusion to date, obviously occlusion is important in practically every phase of clinical dentistry. And as we illustrated and iterated much earlier in your course, there are numerous concepts of a clinical occlusion in various parts of the country. You can call this, if you wish, the geography of occlusion. Depending on which part of the country you study in, you're pretty much influenced by the outstanding star of occlusion in any one part of the country. Whether you realize it or not, down through the various aspects of occlusion and the various modules, we have incorporated all of these various people and their ideas and have put them all together in hopefully a meaningful concept for you which you can apply clinically. Now the main point is that many people, after having two or three of these people lecture to them, are fishing around for the right answer to occlusion. And I feel that this is the best way for you to consider for now and in the future, how to logically approach occlusion, the overview of occlusion or the biology of it, we have attempted to, in an orderly and sequential manner, teach you the physiology of occlusion or how the masticatory system functions. And we've attempted to teach to you the pathology or the dysfunction which can occur. And within the realm of this, knowing the normal, recognizing, diagnosing the abnormal, then applying the appropriate treatment or restorative therapy to get that patient better. Under function, it is important, and I hope you understand now, to be able to clinically apply certain aspects of basic science, such as anatomy, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and histology, because when the masticatory system functions normally, 
the, all of these structures are functioning normally. When, it, when the masticatory system does not function normally, some aspect of the neuroanatomy or the physiology or the histology of one or more parts of the system is put into dysfunction. And in clinical sciences, it's extremely important to have a working knowledge and application of dental anatomy, mandibular kinesiology, mandibular function, and to apply basic anatomy to problems. Now, under dysfunction or pathology of occlusion, you can have parafunction, either in the terms of bruxism or eccentric movements of the mandible, bruxomania, clenching habits, or call it centric bruxism if you wish, and the various aspects of occlusal habits. In traumatic occlusion, there are numerous signs and symptoms uh, and x-ray symptoms and signs of traumatic occlusion, and we've discussed how to recognize these, and we've discussed the etiology of traumatic occlusion. We've gone into great detail of occlusion in periodontal disease and its importance, how to recognize and treat the cracked tooth problem, and specifically how to prevent cracked teeth by having good occlusion in everyday restorative dentistry. We've discussed TM joint dysfunction and myofascial pains. And lastly, under treatment of occlusion, practically every phase of clinical dentistry is important in occlusion. You cannot have good occlusion unless you pay attention to it in everyday restorative dentistry, crown and bridge partials, periodontics, endodontics, ortho, pedodontics, etc. We have discussed at great length the indications and the design for bite plates and occlusal splints. We've talked about spot grinding, partial occlusal adjustment, complete occlusal adjustment. We've discussed at great length condylar versus incisal guidance and the relative importance of each one of these in your patients. We've discussed the pros and cons on cuspid rise versus group function. We've discussed balanced occlusion and the fact that this is not a good idea to have in the natural dentition while more than likely it is extremely advantageous in full dentures. Again, cross-tooth balance has been discussed, the cross-arch balance. We've gone into great length on the cuspid, uh, cusp tip central fossa type of occlusion versus tripodization. The functionally generated path is a specific clinical technique for obtaining good occlusion, which will be discussed later on. The nathologic concept of occlusion is a specific clinical technique for obtaining uh, occlusion in rehabilitation cases, and this will be discussed later. A transographic technique of reconstruction is one which is in vogue particularly in the northern part of the Midwest. It's an extremely complicated technique, and we will not at any time here in dental school go into this technique. I feel that there are other techniques which can get you the desired results a lot easier. The split cast technique uh, is really of limited value to you, but if you're interested in further reading on the split cast technique, you will find an excellent description of this in the book entitled The Physiology of Occlusion by Posselt, which should be in the library. So after all of this time and pie-in-the-sky ideas on occlusion, I think that hopefully we have guided you in the proper direction and given you a base upon which to build your clinical practice. Occlusion properly done on your patients will make you feel like the king of the bridge of your own ship. Faulty occlusion or lousy occlusion, on the other hand, will lead to patients who are uncomfortable and in the end result will be unhappy with you as their family dentist and they quite often will seek better dental care elsewhere if you don't in include and inculcate good occlusion into everyday clinical dentistry.